All right. Uh, so today on the podcast, we have Dr. Ramesh Selty, um, a great, great dentist, an awesome human being. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Ramesh for a little while now. I think the first time that we met, I kind of knew a bit about you before just through friends and, and different colleagues. But I think uh, the first time we met was at a oral surgery uh, course with uh, Neki, with Neki Jamal. I think that was one of the first times. So uh, you are one of my mentors and, you know, you've, uh, you've been doing this for, you know, not too long, but you're, you're extremely skilled and, and have a great, you know, you have just a great presence about you. So we're super excited to have you on the podcast today. Ramaz. Thank you so much, Ricky. Um, it, it's really humbling to hear you say those things. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Uh, as you know, in dentistry, and it's like a craft that we're always honing. So you never think of yourself as having great skills. It's just a uh, constant evolution of getting better. Yeah. And yeah, we met at the Nikki Jamal course hosted by Dentistry Academy in London. So Jeff, me and, and Hisham called me up and saying, hey, we need some clinical instructors. <laughs> um, and it, it might have been around the time when there were some really, like, really strict rules around COVID. So um, it was really challenging to put bigger events on, but those guys always lead the way with great events. And you were one of the participants, and that's how I met you and a couple of other guys. And I saw your hunger for dentistry. And when you see people really hungry for for the betterment of themselves, their skill, and their patients, um, you really want to share everything you have. So thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you. I appreciate those kind words as well. Uh, well, we'll get into education and, and your hunger as well, because you're always, you know, up in your game and and um, and ongoing, and and that's why we we love to have mentors like you. So, um, tell me tell me a little bit about Ramez before he came before he became Doctor Salt. You know, tell me about um, a little bit about your upbringing and maybe kind of what led you to dentistry. Okay, cool. So, how far back are we going here? Like birth? <laughs> yeah, we can do a quick, quick. Uh, Quick little yeah. story, I guess. So, so the important part of my history before becoming a practicing clinician in the province of Ontario and specifically in Toronto um, was the fact that I was an immigrant. And so when I came to Canada from Algeria, uh, being from uh, of Arab descent from my, my parents, my mom being Syrian, my dad being Palestinian, um, we immigrated to Canada when I was eight. And so for me, being an immigrant, not speaking any English, those formed a lot of those are my formative years and i really got a sense of um how important in being feeling included or excluded was um and also being raised by very traditional uh parents with strong work ethic uh, i saw my parents really have to work hard to make a new life for themselves in, in in a new world in canada and we're so grateful and proud to be canadian so I grew a lot of pride to be Canadian. I developed a strong work ethic, um, working with my parents on weekends to uh, make ends meet. Um, and so when, you know, when I finally got into post-secondary education, I took all those values, not you know, having to learn a new language, being in ESL, uh, feeling like I was always on the outside. I took all of those things and I channeled them into positivity and, and um, and it, and it really helped me, although at the time it was really challenging, but in high school and then university and McMaster stud studying biochemistry, it, it helped me channel uh, in good ways um, for, for, my, for my betterment. So I did, Mac after uh, high school in the Mississauga area, I went to McMaster University, studied biochemistry, and of course being an, an immigrant, Arab immigrant uh, family, I had to do the hardest program you could possibly do, which was biochemistry at McMaster. And, uh, and then I did a minor in math because both my parents were math teachers back, back in Al Syria and Algeria. So I grew up just being ahead of the curve in math. So I did a minor, that was my fun. I did a minor in math, uh, always grew up playing chess and, and doing, solving math problems was like a hobby with my dad and I. Um, <laughs> That was totally bonding time. I've got like, uh, like tens and tens of notebooks with uh, problem solving, like doing math problems with my dad. I know that probably sounds wild to um, uh, to anybody, but 
so yeah, I did, I did a biochemistry degree at McMaster and then I did my master's degree. Um, and as, as everybody's career path is, it can be really convoluted. You start somewhere thinking you're going to end up here and all of a sudden you're kind of like zigzagging your way. Yeah. Um, so I thought with biochemistry, I was either going to do a PhD or become a, a, in clinical practice of some kind, whether, whether it was physio, medicine, dentistry. Um, and so, but I ended up being, doing my master's in business and, uh, and then finally went to dental school at Western in London. Gotcha. So you did your biochemistry MBA and then you did your dentistry. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. Which, which was not, it's not a conventional path. Like I, I know a lot of people now that are dentists that are doing an executive MBA. Yeah. And, and that's probably what I would recommend to my older self. If I could go back and give myself some advice, I'd say, you know, why don't you just go directly to what you were always meant to do, which is being in clinical practice and serving your patients and community. Um, and then do, you know, go back and then reverse engineer some of the stuff that you need, like the, the skills of having being able to practice um, uh, the art and science of building a business and the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but I did my MBA before. And, and, and for me, I think that created a very unique uh, combination of uh, education modules, which helped me say, okay, as a dentist, I, I grew my business really quickly because of my MBA background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, this is exactly kind of what uh, our podcast is kind of centered around. There's no, no one goes through the, you know, there's so many pathways that you can go, so many different journeys that can, you can go on. And that's kind of what makes all of us so different and interesting and, and what we can kind of bring to the table, which is great. So it's cool that you kind of did it the other way. Now, did you, did you, like, did you know that you were going to become a dentist? When was it that you thought dentistry was for, for me? Was it during undergrad or during your MBA or? What got you into dentistry specifically? The truth? Yeah. <laughs> um, my dad said, you're going to go into dentistry. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair That's enough. the truth. But, but, you know, like, you know, I'm a very independent, strong-minded person. So, you know, for my dad to say, you know, this is what you're going to do um, is, is really not enough for me to actually do it. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely was the seed. He put the seed in my head. And then I'm like, okay, well... I'm going to understand why my dad wants me to go into dentistry or, or medicine or physio. But for me, I started to really navigate towards dentistry uh, because it had like a great combination of, um, you know, of things and it can come across as a bit of a uh, contrived answer, but yeah. dentistry is the perfect profession for a lot of people. For me, it is. Um, and I knew that, after I did my, during, during my MBA program, I remember I passed my admissions to my dental, my dental admissions letter. You know, when you get the acceptance letter, you open it up. And I remember that, I'll remember that feeling for as long as I live. Cause I opened it up and I'm like, this is what I've been working my entire life for. And somebody, a panel of experts has said that I belong to this group now. Yeah. And that was like a, an aha moment. And, and I remember sliding my acceptance letter to my study buddy, his name is Marty, in my MBA program. I opened it up in my last year of my MBA studies. I slid my acceptance letter to him. He looked at me and he's like, well done, buddy. <laughs> you did and, it. And, and, I, and I think I understood that I wanted to do dentistry during my MBA program when I was studying business, accounting, finance, organizational behavior, marketing, human resources. And then I, did, I, I, you know, I had, had my biochemistry degree under my belt already. And I was talking to hygienists, I interviewed dentists, I was interviewing people in the dental field and in the medical field, because when I did my MBA, I was also working for a biotech startup company founded by a medical doctor who had himself done an MBA. And he said to me, you know, dude, why are you going to do a PhD in biochemistry? You're not, you don't belong in this lab, you know, go do the MBA, then do whatever you want to do. So that was you know, so that's when I did my MBA initially, it was upon his provocation. And, um, and at that point, I did a lot of research and thought, you know what, I'm going to try dentistry, I applied and I got into Western. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Sorry, that was a bit of a roundabout answer there. No, no, not at all. This is that's super interesting. Because you know, dentistry has, you know, business very much tied into it compared to medicine, per se, I guess, especially in Canada. 
Um, so that's that's really interesting. And I, I'm sure that it you know helped you along with with practice ownership, and that's kind of what we're leading to. So um, as you kind of graduated dentistry, um, what were your first couple of years like? Um, and then I guess we'll kind of delve into what you could wish you could have done or differently, or, or if you kind of would have done the exact same thing, essentially. Yeah. So, the, so like what, what were the first couple of years in dental school or dentistry? Yeah, dentistry. Like, did you, you didn't, you didn't go into ownership right away. Did you associate first and then? Yeah. So I, I remember a buddy of mine, my, cl my classmate, Michael, um, saying to me in fourth year dentistry, he's like, I, I know with your MBA background and I was, I was a student leader. I was president of council. I, I um, might've, you know, had, had their accolades. And Michael said to me, I know you're going to go right into ownership and you're going to have a humming bit dental business right away. So it, I had that people had that expectation for me. I had that expectation for myself, but I actually didn't do ownership for six years. I was an associate for six years, which surprises myself. Like yeah. I thought for sure I'd be all over ownership, but I took six years to really learn dentistry. And the first two years to specifically answer your question, um, we're all about exploring not just dentistry, but myself. Like mm -hmm. you become a new version of yourself every few years. Yeah. And, and um, you know, we take, I always think about this, you know how we take panorexes for our patients to look at their wisdom teeth yeah, and their sinuses and everything else. When I look at a pan, I say to myself, how old is this? How old does this x-ray need to be for me not to be able to rely on it anymore? <laughs> and, and so I look at our, our development as an individual. I would say every three to five years, you become a new version of yourself. And so for the first year, couple of years of dentistry, not only was I changing my perspective on myself and out the outside world, I was becoming a new me. And I didn't want to commit to another endeavor too quickly. I thought, you know what? I'm learning. I'm mm -hmm. doing all the edu. I did more education. I was literally in education courses every single weekend in my first two years. Um, and and so that you know, I really recommend that for for new graduates is embrace the learning process. Just because you graduate and you cross that stage with your certificate, that's not the time to give up on learning. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you you want to become a lifelong learner and hey maybe ownership is for you right away and if you have that confidence and conviction do it and you probably can't go wrong anyways but for me i i spent the first couple of years doing education programs if i could give my older self or my younger self any advice it would be uh to be a little more confident mm. it would be to say you you don't be so cautious you know, and, and I don't want people to, to, to think that I lacked confidence, but maybe, you know, as learners, you sometimes have to be humble. You have to humble yourself. So you, you kind of, you're always balancing confidence with insecurities. It's, it's a, it's a tightrope, yeah. but I, I would have said, don't be so cautious on the business side of things. Definitely exercise extreme caution when you're practicing dentistry, because human beings and patients are trusting you. And I was always really cautious. But on the business side of things, I probably could have ventured off into ownership a little quicker. Yeah. What What do you think? So you're you're you think it's more of the confidence of you know starting up that business and, and kind of going from there. Is that what you're kind of referring to essentially? People had instilled in me the concept that you can't practice dentistry in Toronto or in major cities. People had instilled in me uh, in my in my like formative dental years to to make sure that you do you associate for multiple multiple years be, before you become an owner because you don't know what all every single dental procedure is like mm -hmm. you don't have to master root canals and fillings to become an owner yeah and that's where your dental networks come into play you know you you don't have to become the most excellent version of your dental self to become a dental business owner when you become a dental business owner you it definitely affects your lifestyle because you become you become your business right it becomes part of who you are uh it becomes a 24 7 responsibility so if you're ready for that you know be, be become an owner yeah but but for me it was um 
yeah, I just didn't think that people really cared about my version of a dental business. Like, why am I going to go see Dr. Salty? You know, he owns that practice. The guy just graduated three years ago. So, but, but, but we have, you know, everybody has an expression of the reform of dentistry and what it means, what their culture of their office was. And honestly, Ricky, I don't think I really knew myself enough when I graduated dentistry to be able to express my sense of what a dental practice should be. So I'm kind of happy that, um, that I took five, six years to build the business. And, 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 it, and I think it went just the way it was supposed to go. I'm a firm believer in everything happening in, in its own time and everything happens for a reason. But um, dental, the way to answer the question of when do, you, when do you become a dental business owner is, do you have a pretty good sense of the dental space? Like, have you practiced root canals? Have you practiced, have you, you know, have you done enough courses? Do you feel like you know what kind of culture you want to build? Do you know how you want to approach dentistry? What's your narrative for dentistry? And I can talk about what my narrative is and how it, it evolved. But once you have a sense of that, yeah. build that business. Yeah. You know, go ahead and do it because you, you'll be able to pull it off. That's true. I, but I, and I also think that you know, mul- associating in multiple positions, I think it's, it helps form your narrative as well. Um, so it's exactly spot on with, with what you're saying. Can you see different things that you like and that you don't like? Um, you get introduced to different kind of cases, technology, whatever it may be, different ways of practicing, because each each practice is so different. And, you know, if you're practicing in one or two clinics, then it might be limited from from what you're able to see what's to see what's out there, essentially. And and you're spot on with I always have that feeling as well. It's like I got to master everything. Like how, how is a patient going to come in and I, you know, can't take out this eight or I can't do an implant. That's like, you know, money out the door. But some of the most, you know, successful dental business owners are, are you honestly usually even hands off sometimes or they're, you know, one or two days a week. Um, so it's not necessary that we have to be the jack of all trades. You're exactly right with that. And, and it's okay to, you know, have an associate to come in to help with certain procedures or, um, or, or just have a limited practice with, uh, with the specific scope of dentistry. So, um, I like that you, you did mention that. Um, and then I, I like what you said about, sorry to interrupt you. I like what you said about going to different offices. You, you, it's really hard to always be paving new roads. Yeah. Like that's a really hard thing to do. Sometimes you just want to settle down. Just work at one office, nine to five, just have a nice routine, especially after so many years of studies. Mm -hmm. But to spend time at different offices should be like a a core requirement for yourself so that you understand what different office cultures look like. Yeah, exactly. And and not even necessarily working at them. You could even always just shadow. A lot of dentists are pretty open to that. Um, You know, I I think trying trying to have a mentor and I know we've talked about mentorship quite a bit as well having that mentor um that you can kind of maybe visualize yourself um through them in, in 10 15 years kind of thing as well is very important as well so um I yeah. like that um so then I, when you you talk about mentors there Ricky I got to interrupt here again there you go, go I love it. what you're I love what you're talking about when you you know it when you talk about mentors and I, and I t- t- would teach this to my, my students at Western University in the practice administration department. I say one of the takeaways is find mentors. But OK, that's easy enough to say. We know that you have to find mentors. But how do you identify a mentor as somebody that is suited to be a mentor? First of all, the biggest concentric circle. But then narrowing that scope down, saying, how is that mentor qualified to be my mentor? Because you matter, what you, how you come to the table is an essential part of obviously uh, the development of your dental brand. Um, so your mentor might not be a good mentor for me, but they're both excellent mentors. Yeah. And and so you just and the, the way you said it is the way I think you can identify what the mentor for you should be. Is imagine that per imagine you become that person fifteen years later. Are you happy? Mm-hmm. And yeah. I said earlier, we all change every five years. We become a different version of ourselves. But, for, you know, at some point in time, uh, you're going to have to commit, you know, to the type of dentist you want to be and say, is that person the kind of person I want to be? And a lot of times in my career, I couldn't answer that question or it was no. 
Yeah. Or, you know, when it's yes, you know, that's a win. Because you just do everything you can to hold on to that person. Yeah, exactly. And and you're right. And it it can be that you you don't see yourself to be that person 10, 15 years, which is actually it's not a bad thing as well, because you know, this gives you an idea of maybe what you might what you don't want to do or, or the path that you don't want to take, which is completely fine as well. These these kind of all form, I think, who you will become in the future. Um so yeah, the, for sure. the, other thing, uh, the other thing I want to touch on is you did technically, I guess, work a little bit rural when you first started. And then, so was it, was it completely rural or somewhat the first, the first years of associating? It wasn't really in the city, right? Yeah, it was, it was rural. So I went out to the Belleville area mm-hmm. and that's in Eastern Ontario for, for uh, those of us that don't have a good understanding of Ontario. Ontario is a massive province, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Sudbury is not Northern Ontario. Yeah. Northern Ontario is like you know a- another ten hour drive north. Yeah, but but I went out to Belleville, which is only about two hours east of Toronto, and um, I got that opportunity. I, I had just spoke. I had just given a talk uh, to the to the incoming dental students and their parents at Western University. I come off stage, and somebody approached me. Um, an insurance agent saying, Hey, I've got an opportunity for you. I'm like, okay, that's great. I haven't even entertained that yet, but it was my fourth year. I just was going through the graduation process. And she said, yeah, it's a great opportunity, busy office. I'm like, yeah, sure. Let's do the interview. I end up driving two hours away from Toronto, which is my home, Toronto, Mississauga. Yeah. And I'm like, I felt like I was in nowhere land. <laughs> like I was like, it terrified me, but I, you know, I interviewed with the dentist. Um, the interview went really well. Uh, the community was amazing. Um, so, so I planned to go on an adventure, stay out there for a year. Yeah. And then I would come back to Toronto. Um, but the community of Belleville and Quint, the Bay of Quinty and Coburg embraced me and brought me into, um, Ontario, you know, smaller town, Ontario communities and the culture that they offer. And it was beautiful. And that's, that's, I think that's where it also circles back to the way I, I, you know, I started in this world as, as an immigrant to Canada. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is like real Canadian living. Yeah. And um, so I went out there and I was, I was doing all types of dentistry um, because there aren't as many dentists in those areas. So I was doing root canals. I was doing surgery. I was doing pediatric dentistry. I was working with the local specialists. And one year turned into 12 years. All of a sudden, 12 years later, I was an associate for six years. And then I ended up owning the offices. I had partners. I was the team dentist to a junior A hockey team. Saw lots of injuries and fractures. I was on call. That was super exciting for me. I did lots of trauma dentistry, which brought me into like that, you know, that adrenaline rush you get when you're, when you're trying to, um, uh, manage a difficult surgery yeah. or, 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 um, traumatic event. That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. That's awesome. So you ended up saying 12 years. Wow. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, you ended up partnering and then, you know, that was kind of your, your way into ownership essentially. Yeah. 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 So, so after six years, I realized that I brought so much value into the practices, uh, yeah. humbly spoken. I, I was, I was like, you know what? I'm bringing so much value and equity into these practices. I, you know, I have to get a piece of this. Like yeah. I have to, if I don't, then all of this sacrifice that I've made and changed my lifestyle will have felt like a little bit, you know, I just wanted to get a little piece of it. So then I approached the owner who had offered me partnership multiple, multiple times. And I had declined because I was enjoying being an associate. Yeah. I was traveling. I was doing CE. I was serving my patients. I was doing all types of different dentistry. Why did I want ownership? Yeah. Um, and then finally, I'm like six years later, I approached him and uh, he, he agreed and we formed a partnership. I love it. Nice. That's awesome. Now, uh, so I know... Because you did work rural and you're, you're saying that you were able to do more procedures than maybe you would have been able to do in Toronto or Mississauga, um, give you a broader exposure and, and you were kind of able to kind of get into it, essentially. What I know what 
you primarily focus your practice on now is IV sedation, oral surgery, implant dentistry. Um, is that kind of how it grew? Like, did you, did you have this vision while you were in dental school? Did this vision come later on when you started doing these cases? Uh, yeah. So I guess, um, you take it from there essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So this theme of we all evolve and you become a different version every few years is, uh, feels like it's, it, it works for me right now. So I'm going to play to that. You know, I was, I was evolving every, every three to five years formed a new chapter in my life. So it was like five years of associating, then five more years of ownership in a partnership context. And then I sold my business to my partners. Mm -hmm. And when I left three months later, after I sold my business, COVID hit. Uh, okay. So, so it was like, all my friends were like, that was divine intervention on your part. Like you literally sold your business and then you just hunkered down during COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and then, and then a, like a year or two went by and I had somebody reach out to me saying, Hey, I, um, I'm, I'm interested in surgery. Um, would you, and I, you know, I, I heard you you know, you like surgery. Do you think you could mentor me? So I went to their office and I would watch them do surgery. And mm -hmm. when they hit their limit, as far as like skill level, I would jump in and finish the case. Okay. And we just kept doing these cases. Um, and you know, I was getting paid a little bit, but for me, it was about service. I was serving my, you know, this newer colleague who is, uh, first year out of dentistry from, he went to McGill university and the office was in Ottawa. You're going to think this is crazy. So I was going from Toronto to Ottawa wow. once a month. And I was just hanging out with my buddy, Matt, and he was a newer dentist, but he was so humble. He was so kind and he just wanted to improve his skill set. So I was going to do surgery with him, except he was doing the surgery. As soon as he'd hit a wall, I'd jump in, finish the case. I love it. Um, so, so really the way, my new model, the way I innovated my new dental business model was I went from associating to ownership and a partnership selling. And I'm like, I kind of just sat around during COVID thinking, what the heck am I going to do right now? Um, and when my buddy Matt in Ottawa, and incidentally, his father had owned the practice. So we kind of had that kind of latitude to be able to function in the capacity that we wanted to. Yeah. Uh, so we were having a good time. Like I was high fiving him behind the scenes, talking about the roots and dilacerations and panorexes and CT scans. So we were having a, a really good time. It definitely was not like a money maker for me. It's not like I was making a living driving yeah. to Ottawa, mentoring uh, my buddy in surgery. But it it that put the seed in my head. I'm like, okay, wait a sec. He wanted me to go to his office and complete the surgical procedures. I'm like. Why would he want me to go? Okay, well, I guess he, you know, he thinks a little highly of my skill set. Turns out the model worked in the context of mentorship surgery. Then Dentistry Academy called me up, and that's when I met you. Yeah. And you guys wanted some help just doing some instructing, and I was conveying some of my passions. I'm like, wait, you want me to spend the day conveying what I love to these newer dentists, and they want to hear it? Yeah, sign me up. I do that all day long. <laughs> I love it. And, so, so then, so then another clinician called me up, uh, Dr. Joshua Shi, and he said, look, I saw you up on the RCDSO. I know that you offer intravenous sedation. Do you think you could join me in, uh, running IV lines, sedating patients, and we would collaborate on surgical procedures. So I did that for a little while. Awesome. So it was just kind of these little things that kept happening. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess these surgical services are, are in demand. Patients need this service. Uh, and then from there I had, you know, one, so it went from those three offices to all of a sudden I was at 20 different offices. I built an intravenous sedation cart. I built a surgical cart and I was going into offices and now I've got two big old Milwaukee carts. So when I walk into a building, I look like I'm about to change all the plumbing in the building. <laughs> Little do they know. <laughs> yeah i love it i love it now if we kind of i guess if we backtrack a little bit so we're we're trying to focus on uh on the business aspect with this with this podcast and it's up to you how much you kind of want to delve into it and, and what you want to leave out so with um when you decided to kind of partner in um when you you know when you had when 
you were in ownership for five, six years. Uh, what was that like? Do you wish you had, you know, done it a different way? You hear so much negativity about partnerships. Um, you know, if you kind of go back, you know, obviously it worked out and, and, you know, you are where you are right now. It's hard to kind of say you regret anything, but do you wish you had done something on your own or, or do you kind of still wish that you went about it the way you did? Yeah. Yeah. These are all like, when you talk about questions about the past, it's for me always a balancing act of accepting things as they have, have as they have, uh, as they were and as they've come mm -hmm. and balancing that with, um, and also like positive manifestation yes. with like actively going into the past and learning from the things that were not mistakes, but the way, the way that the things develop naturally, how would, how would I tweak them so that they might better serve my present self? Yeah. Um, so it's like, you know, it's a balancing act. You know what I mean, Ricky? Like you never want to look on the past and say, I regret X, Y, Z. No, I, I think it's all, it's all part of the experience. So even if it's a bad experience, you're learning from it and that's how you grow. That's how you, you know, become the person you are today. For sure. And all you can do is just, you know, you change the way you approach the current world based on the things you went through. So partnerships are definitely a challenging thing. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't news to me. I knew partnerships. Everybody told me partnerships are challenging. Yeah. I did an MBA. Like I, you know, I understand the legal and financial ramifications of partnership. But I think partnerships work. Partnerships are really, really good. Mm -hmm. But just like any other decision, you have to understand who your partners are. Yeah. You understand, you have to understand what the values of your partners are. And you have to understand your partner's ability to commit to that value system. And also you have to understand what your partner's goals are. Mm -hmm. And if all those things are in alignment, like if you form a matrix and everything is jiving, then partnership, the partnership can work for sure. Yeah. But, but if your partnership is structured in such a fashion that maybe, maybe your partner, maybe, you know, maybe you're a newer dentist. And you're willing to work seven days a week. You're willing to bring you. You're willing to bring it all to the table. Mm -hmm. And then you've got other partners that maybe are not contributing as much um, from an hour to clinic standpoint. And you had the expectation that they might. Then maybe that's going to create some distortion and friction points in the machine. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and also like you really have to. Con I, I was to be speaking to an oral surgery buddy of mine. And he mentioned to me, why do you need a partner? And when he said that, it kind of, for, for, for some reason, triggered something. Why? Why do you want a partner? Why do you need a partner? Is it because you're being overly cautious of your skill set? Is it because you don't want to work that hard? Is it because that person's skill set totally complements yours? And I think that now you're on to a good reason of why you might partner. Um, Ricky, let's say you and I partner and we're not partnering, right? But let's say we were, you would be, you know, you're, 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 let's say you're excellent in orthodontics and I love surgery and you want nothing to do with surgery and I want nothing to do with orthodontics. And we bring a practice together and we do general dentistry, but we complement each other's skill set. Great. I'm going to work three days a week. You're going to work three days a week or four or five or whatever. So it works. But if you don't have that, um, like assessment of the situation beforehand, it probably could create problems. And in today's marketplace, financially, do you need a partner? You know, like if you're buying an office that's maybe has 15 chairs and it's worth $15 million, okay, then maybe you need a partner because how are you going to service all that? Yeah. Um, but if you're buying an office with six chairs, do you, you know, the bank's going to give you the money. Mm hmm so, so you don't really like it. So I would, I would say avoid partnerships at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that's what we're, that's what we got to. Okay. No, but, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. not sugarcoating it, you know, Man. avoid partnerships at all costs. But if you need a partner, then find the right partner. Yeah. And you're right. You, and you know, you touched on great points and you know, I think the biggest thing is the whole clinical putting in the same amount of clinical hours. Cause I think, eventually you, 
you know, you get a bad taste in your mouth if you're, and even if the, the dynamic is that you have a, there's an older dentist that's managing and you're the younger dentist and you're putting more of the clinical. I think when you become better clinically and, and you're starting to help with the management, you kind of eventually get a sour taste, I guess, in your mouth when you feel like, okay, like now I don't really know if I need this older dentist to help with this partnership anymore. Like, yeah, I, I've kind of figured and, it out. And now and, we're and, not and, doing anything clinically. And, and, and you said sour taste in your mouth. I'm so sorry for interrupting you, man. But you said you trick you're triggering all these thoughts. So sorry. <laughs> if you no no, you're 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 it's all so you said you said you might leave a sour taste in your mouth. Like, look, if you and I are partners and there's an issue, you have to be able to, to be comfortable enough with me and vice versa that you can have a sit down with me and say, Listen, dude, I don't think this is making me happy right now. I'm feeling like this sort of and even if you can't pinpoint the exact issue that you have, you just say, I'm not happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you have to be able to have that openness with your partner. Yeah, I know you're right. But on the flip side, like one of the one of my first associate associate positions um, was with two dentists, equal partners, one that was, you know, a little bit older than the other. And it's exactly how you said it. They were completely in unison. They did they each did six hours a day for four days a week. One like surgery, one liked um, ortho, and it worked out. From what I could see from the outset, it, it was working out great, and still is working out great. So there definitely is, you know, partnerships that do work. I've heard that it's, you know, often it's it's a rare thing, but when you do find it and it does work, it's it's a nice thing to have. So um, it's beautiful when it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. I guess so. Kind of going forward a little bit forward, um, when you decided to sell. Did you have like, again, this is kind of, we're kind of focusing on the business aspect and, and, you know, the journeys that you can take in that sense. Um, you were kind of, I'm assuming you were comfortable financially that, you know, maybe you didn't have to work or maybe you you'd associate a little bit and that would kind of be more comfortable, I guess, or, you know, you didn't have to focus much on the business anymore. What was your vision or did you have even a plan after you sold, um, I know eventually, you know, you turned that into into an oral surgery um, gig and kind of like what you mentioned. But um, what was your plan after selling, essentially? Or was there a plan? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So there wasn't a plan. There wasn't. No. Yeah. I And I like I, I really do. I'm a firm believer in go with what the world presents in front of you. You know, try not to fight to do something this far away, try to like acknowledge what the world has presented you with mm -hmm. and just put those pieces together, play the cards that you're dealt. Yeah. And so I know, no, I never had a plan. Do, as, um, do I wish I was like, you know, those people that are just like really future thinkers and able to strategically plan their future. I'm not one of those people. Yeah. So, so, I so can... I didn't have that plan. <laughs> I guess I'm the opposite. I'm always, I'm always trying to envision, even though things change, you're right. Every two, three, four years, things kind of change, you know, you change as a person and, and, um, but I'm always kind of trying to think of what's, what's coming at I'm I'm open to new things, but I'm always, I have a goal, I guess, but everyone's different. And I like that you, you're honest in that, you know, you, maybe you, you were well off financially that you didn't need to necessarily have something to fall back on right away, which, which can be part of the, you know, why you kind of went that way essentially and it worked yeah. perfectly I, that right before COVID, i guess <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i mean sometimes things just work out but so although i didn't have a plan i knew what i liked and i knew what i loved and i knew what you know lit lit me up and what it, it one was surgery yeah um the other was intravenous sedation which i had perfected that system in the offices that i was at the three offices that i was at gotcha. and we got up to about 50 employees it took the offices from about 25 to 50 employees. Um, so I knew that I loved building culture, building teams. I loved serving my patients and serving my patients, serving my team and serving my community. It was always about service for me. Yeah. And when I focused on the narrative of it being about service, because that's how I was raised, is you're there to you know, help your neighbor, help whoever's around you. So um, the offices that I was at, I felt like maybe I wanted to tweak them in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So my plan was um, to 
go back to basics and rebuild the kind of dental uh, business that I wanted. And although I didn't have the plan of it being intravenous surgery services at 10 different offices in the GTA, it ended up uh, growing like that. And because that's where the need was, that's where that's where the offices wanted. That's what patients needed. There's such long wait times for surgical services, especially with IV sedation. Um, so I think that's why it's grown so quickly. In a couple of years, I've got about 15 offices. That's awesome. I love that. Um, was I was I well off financially? Um, you know, I never I never really looked at it like that. Yeah. I I was comfortable for sure. I was comfortable, but um, I wasn't necessarily perfectly happy with my clinical space. Gotcha. Yeah. So it was more about creating the environment that allowed me to do what I loved, which is what Ricky, it's about spending time with my patients. Yeah. It's about telling my patients stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one patient who I was treating, he had lost an arm in a train in an accident at work. He lost his arm and I ended up doing dental, dental implant rehabilitation because he used his mouth as his left arm. Wow. And he, so when he put gloves on, he'd have, he'd have, you know, that type of thing. And he would use his teeth, yeah. um, at, you know, as his hand. And, and, and then I, I, I talked to another patient who told me, oh, dentists are all like lawyers and accountants. You guys are all like, we don't, you know, so everybody has a story, whether it's, it resonates with you or not. And so I wanted to learn about my patient's stories. And that probably was the found one of the foundations for me wanting to move on from the transactional business part of dentistry to really going back to basics and understanding why am I a dentist and why, why am I doing dentistry the way I want to do it? I love that. That's, I think that's such an important lesson. Even for me, as I'm going into my journey early on, that's something I learned early on. I had these, you know, when you graduate, you're kind of hungry, you have debt to pay off. Um, obviously, you know, you obviously care for your patients and, and that's, that's the biggest thing. But, you know, I was overworking myself. I wanted to reach a certain monetary goal. And when you reach it, it's like, okay, this is it. What happens now? Where, yeah. <laughs> where's this? <laughs> like it's, it just, it wasn't what you kind of expect it to be. And you're spot on in that it's the interactions with the patients. You know, you, you do a case for a person like that and it changes their lives. And that, that's what really brings you satisfaction. Um, so I would definitely take that 100% of the day you know, over at the end of the day, dentists are going to be comfortable as long as you put in your work, you know, you, you give the best to your patients. We're all luckily, you know, very comfortable in the sense that, you know, we can live a very comfortable life. Um, so I think it's actually what you do with that life and, and how you change other people's lives is the biggest thing. And, you know, dentistry is, isn't always going to be the big smile makeover or, but even just changing their perception on dentistry or making you know, an anxious patient, less anxious, um, is a, is a very big thing. And I think with IV station, um, you know, having, having, you know, starting my IV sedation program as well, I guess with, with the clinics I work at, um, it's a, it's a game changer. It's, it's fun. It's comfortable for the patients. It's such a good service, I think. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, let's talk about more, you know, what's, what's your weekly schedule like, I guess, now that you're, you know, you're just kind of traveling between offices with your, with your surgical, um, business, essentially traveling surgical business. Yeah. Um, I just want to touch upon that point we were talking about. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed with all of the CE that you're putting together in the early part of your career. Like, are you, how many years have you been practicing now? Uh, it's been about two, three, two and a half, three years. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Like, you know, like everybody should take the first five years and do that, you know, optimize your learnings yeah. and build your skill set. And you're doing it in the first couple of years. I do find it remarkable. I'm not just pumping your tires like that. That is remarkable. I appreciate it, brother. I, you know, we look up to guys like you and that's, that's what pushes us. So. <laughs> you guys are the pioneers, even though you're not old, you're the pioneers, <laughs> you're the pioneers. but, um, but no, you're, when, I, it's, it's the biggest return on your investment and the return, return on your investment for your patients. Um, yeah. you know, people think about stocks, you know, investing in stocks, housing, whatever, invest in yourself. That's, that's the biggest return that you could really have. So, um, I appreciate and, and, that. yeah. And everybody, 
everybody has their own fulfillment. Like Mm -hmm. I get fulfilled in certain ways. You get fulfilled in different ways. I know dentists that kind of go in and out of appointments and their fulfillment is just nine to five. I want to get out so I can go be with my family. Yeah. And that's wonderful. Once you figure out what brings you joy, then do that. Do just do more of that. Um, so, so now like for my, for my day to day, that, that, that changed totally for me because before I was going to the same, I had three offices. I was serving the same community. I had the same schedule. I worked Monday to Thursday, never worked Friday because I kept Friday and Saturday for all of my CE engagements. Yeah. You know, being with the Ontario Dental Association, um, um, with my local dental association doing, uh, usually continue education programs, as you know, they're either on a Friday or Saturday. Yes. Yeah. So it just gave me time to do all that. Now I met sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm working Sundays. If I've got a, a dentist or a specialist or somebody that wants me to run IV lines on a Sunday, you know, I'm doing that. Uh, I do like to work Monday to Friday mm-hmm. and it can be, it could be downtown Toronto one day. I could be Niagara the next day, Alliston the day after, Oshawa the day after that. And you pack your stuff every morning in your car and you drive to the office and you're dealing with 10 different cultures, 10 different offices, you know, many different personalities and archetypes. Yeah. So you have to you have to become uh, really nimble. You have to be able to um, function in different environments. You have to be adaptable. Yes, that's true. And then I guess you got to be very well structured and, and be able to teach these offices as well, because, you know, sedations, uh, it's not like it's super risky, but you have to put the proper protocols in place, um, you know, to make everything run smoothly. How do you find it? So you kind of mentioned that you're probably going to these offices maybe once, twice a month max, I'm assuming. Um, you know, how do you find the relationships with the, the staff? Um, do you bring your own staff? Cause I know, you know, some, some bring their own assistants, their own nurses. Um, so what, what's your kind of protocol and, and how do you, how, cause I, you know, it's obvious that you love building relationships. Do you find it hard when you go, you know, once, twice a month and, and trying to build that relationship? Yeah. So I went from having 50 staff to one staff member. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I don't even like that term, you know, staff. I have a team member. I have one team yeah. member. And that team member manages my schedule. She's a treatment coordinator. Um, and, and you have to be really regimented because offices are booking your schedule. So these offices are trusting you with their patients. They're not your patients. They're their patients. And that becomes our patient. Yeah. And you show up to the practice. You got to get there early. You have to set up your, you do your surgical setup. Um, and, and you're doing consultations with these offices for the patients, you're taking, you're getting imaging, you're getting all of the necessary uh, clinical data points that you need. Um, And and it does have to be really regimented. So I do have one team member uh, that helps me stay super organized with all these offices. Gotcha. And does she come with you to these offices or? or Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes where possible. Yeah. Yeah, Where possible. So I think it's really helpful to have at least one common thread between all the different offices. Uh, the reality is when you're, when you are in different offices, not only is the office trusting you and the patient's trusting you, but I'm trusting the office. Yeah. Like I need to know this office has their systems well created, well built, well maintained. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to have the eyewash station. They have to have, their emergency protocol and emergency equipment. Everybody has to have all the certifications. So when I vet a new office, I have a binder full of all the team members that I'm working with, all of their credentials. I have the nurse's credentials. Mm -hmm. And I have a good understanding of the way their culture is. So if it's a, you know, fast and furious type office, um, I'm less likely to work with them because although it may be more productive, I need to know that I need to be able to trust that they've got all of the necessary uh, procedures and protocol in place to best care for the patient. Yeah. Yeah. And for the- so when I have one common thread, that one, that one team member, 
it allows me to be able to build some structure and reliability into my into my days. Yeah, I like that. And and you know, for those that don't know that that are listening, it's it is pretty obviously it's just pretty regulated in Canada and specifically Ontario. Um, you know, you're it's a single drug. I think some have some are able to do multiple drugs, but uh, you need a nurse, and, and certain regulations are a bit tougher than maybe in some states. Um, so so it is important to have that, and that's kind of what I, what I was wondering. And for, you know, dental students or new graduates or even dentists that may be looking for a traveling surgeon like yourself, what's like a, what's a day, a day for you like? What's a, what's a normal day for you like? Like, like clinically, like what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. Like what's, what's yeah. your schedule like? Is there some consult? Yeah. Is there some post-ops? Is there oh. some treatment? So, How does that work? So I do find my current schedule starts a lot earlier than I've ever had before. So I'm up at five, five thirty in the morning. Wow. Um, is it hard to do that? Yeah, it is. I mean, naturally I like getting up early, but I'm up at five, five thirty. I'm getting my kits ready. Yes. Um, you know, I'm off to the gym for half hour, hour. Um, I get on the road and I'm driving anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour and 10 minutes to get to the office. Mm -hmm. I arrive to the office. I have a morning meeting with the team, make sure that everybody's got a smile on their face. Uh, maybe not right away in the morning, but you know, everybody is together. We're talking about the schedule. The nurse is there. The assistants are there. We've got multiple rooms ready to go. We've got our surgical setup. Uh, we might be placing a couple of implants in the morning, doing a bone graft all under IV sedation, maybe taking a, a, a couple of sets of wisdom teeth out. Um, for me, communication with my team is essential, but also with my patient and their guardians. So we've got multiple rooms, including a recovery room. We're doing a surgical procedure under IV. The nurse stays with the patient as well as I do. Uh, like you said, in the province of Ontario, anesthesia, single drug, which I'm licensed to do, is still a highly regimented and regulated process, as it should be, because we are sedating human beings and we need to make sure, we need to ensure their maximum safety. So I'm one drug per patient and I stay with that patient until they're discharged. And then I go to the next patient. Yeah. And if you've got two nurses you're working with and you can afford to do that, wonderful. Then you can, you know, you can re be recovering one patient and off to the next patient. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to have their advanced cardiac life-saving certification. So, um, you know, with the current environment, there's so many changes going on. So we're, tr we're always trying to keep up. You go to the next patient, you know, finish that, start and finish that procedure. Once that's finished and that patient's just charged, now you're off to the next procedure. Yeah. And it's basically kind of just like, you know, you're back and forth through the day. And it can be, it can be overwhelming. So it's not something that, let's say you're new to intravenous sedation surgery, whether you're a new graduate or not, you know, whether you've been doing it for years and years and years, or you just started doing it, you have to build your endurance and you have to build your skill set and your ability to handle a full surgical day. It's not it's not easy. No, it's not at all. <laughs> so I would counsel anybody that maybe is contemplating doing something like this. I'm always happy to mentor. I'm always happy to share everything. Um, but start with one or two surgeries in your day. Do a morning surgery, and that's how I started. Do a morning surgery and then an afternoon surgery. Yeah. And just keep it like that. And if you finish early then, you know, more opportunity for you to spend um, with your team, grab a coffee, catch up on CE or readings. And then from there, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, you can build it up so that you, you might be at five, six, seven, eight surgeries in a day, which is a lot. It is. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. And it's, it's um, you know, general dentistry is pretty draining, but compared to general dentistry, it's you know, it's physical, it's very physical on you as well. It takes a physical toll, but obviously the mental toll, because you're, you're in surgery, you're worrying, worrying about the IV sedation. Um, and surgery is one of those things you can't really predict, you know, you can always go through the motions and, and have plan A, plan B, plan C in place, but surgery can change quite quickly. And, and then you add the added factor of the sedation, whether the patient, you know, you think they're sedated or not, that can play a factor. So 
it definitely is quite draining. It can be quite draining, but it's uh, it is super exciting, and it's a great service for the patients. It it is it is really draining, isn't it? Like you, you like like the pressure is on. <laughs> yeah, the pressure is on. I had I had a newer dentist graduate, a new a new a new dentist, and he called me up and he said, "Can I come shadow you?" And I get calls every single sometimes daily, but every single week for people to come shadow. And I'm always really, I always say, why don't you come and hang out with me for a couple of hours and then we can figure out the rest of the day. Yeah. The reason I say that is even somebody shadowing can be overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. Like for somebody to just be watching you do your art, you know, your, your, your artistic work of dentistry and your clinical practice can be overwhelming. And you want to make sure that you've got all of the energies in the room, you know, properly focused on that patient. Yeah. 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 And, and. I, he said to me something that really triggered a thought. He said, he said, how do you get these offices to trust you? I'm like, what do you mean? What are you talking? What, what, what are you talking about? Like, I thought he was up to something like, did you, is he so seeing something I don't? <laughs> and he's like, no, how do these people trust you? And I'm like, well, that's, a, that's a really good point because my, I think the the past couple of years have moved so quickly and so many offices have asked me to come do surgeries. It occurred to me, this guy has a valid point. Like these people actually invite me back and then things go so well they invite me back again just because i have a regular schedule with them you know i started to almost take it for granted i'm like whoa wait a sec this is a really special relationship these offices are inviting you back they can pick anybody they can invite anybody they're inviting you back and um and the other thing that i it, i you know i like a moments of clarity is during the day i'll be like in the patient's mouth I've just taken out 10 teeth. There's lots of bleeding going on. And the procedure just, the procedure just went sideways on me. Mm -hmm. And I've got two, three assistants suctioning. And I'm like, I've got, I've, sometimes I got to like think of the big picture. I'm, you know, I'm asking the nurse what the vitals are like. The patient's getting a little stressed out. Add a little more sedation. There's more bleeding going on. Where's the bleeding happening? Uh, I've got all the, I've got two more teeth. I just got a suture cold. And, and the, I've got another patient about to, you know, show up in the waiting room. I've got, um, I've got to deal with this surgery. So all, things can get, things can go sideways on you really quickly in surgery. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, this office is trusting me with their patient. I want to be invited back. I don't want to have delays in time. And the entire, you know, like the assumption is I'm going to finish the surgery to perfection. And you know, in dentistry, there's no such thing as perfection. Yeah. So you got to be able to get to the finish line, be on time and get the invite back. It's a lot going on. It is. No, definitely. Yeah, I mean, they, they bring up a good point. It is a, it, it's a, it's a tough thing to gain trust from, you know, from other dentists and, and having them bring you over and, and doing their surgeries and taking care of their patients. So kudos to you that you've been able to kind of build up that many clinics and, and, uh, and you're still welcome back, which means things are going well. <laughs> good feeling, right? Yeah, of course. Um, so, Ramez, I guess um, you kind of mentioned regulations and all that. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, you've, you've done so much in terms of outreach, teaching. Um, talk to me a little bit more about that, because I think it's amazing what you've done in terms of giving back to the community um, and, and helping other dentists grow and and recently you, we were just talking about your you've become an associate professor at the university of west with that mug showing that mug western of ontario um teaching clinical oral surgery so huge congratulations on that that's that's an awesome feat to to be able to go back and share what you love to to dental students so um tell us a little bit more about about all that I know it's quite a bit because you do quite a bit. So maybe give us just a brief idea of what you do outside of the operatory, I guess. Yeah. So that's the other thing that when I left, when I left the ownership side of dentistry, a lot of things changed. Like when I was an owner, I had control over what I was doing. Now as an associate, surgical associate, I have to, the only thing I can control is, do I want to work with that office or not? Or do I want to serve this patient or not? Um, but the other thing that changed when I transitioned into being a surgical associate was I wanted to build my career in a way that honored my future self. 
So I wanted to, I said to myself, I want to, I said to my, imagine yourself 15 years later from now, and you look back on yourself. Are you going to be proud, you know, of the kind of career you had? And for the most part, I said, yes, but there are some things that I wanted to tweak. Yeah. And so in order for me to um, kind of adjust those things, I thought, okay, what kinds of things, you know, bring me joy. And that, that, you know, that was teaching and mentorship. I even hate the word teaching, not hate it. That's a strong word, but teaching to me feels like one-sided. I'm, I'm giving you information. Well, that's not true. You know, when we're teaching, we're collaborating. Yeah. So when, when students say to me, thank you so much for your teachings, I'm like, no, thank you for the collaboration. Cause you inspired me in that moment of me conveying information to you as much as you think maybe I've inspired you, you know, in the di didactic delivery of that, you know, quanta of information. Yeah. So you've done more for me than I've done for you. But so teaching was one of those things, Ricky, is I, I started to do more and more teaching. I taught at the University of Western Ontario for 12 years, didactically in practice administration. And from Belleville, I was commuting back to London a lot to teach. COVID hit, all that stopped. Now I'm, I've come back in oral surgery doing clinical instructing. Um, volunteerism was always a core part of myself as an individual. I was always raised that you give back from my Arab parents. They're always like, you know, you have to serve your community. You have to take care of your younger sister, take care of your younger brother. Yeah. Um, so, so for me, uh, community service was essential. So I, I've worked at homeless shelters, um, I've worked with a gift from the heart organization. I'm currently a mentor and, uh, part of the sort of advisor group with the new dentist study club. Um, I've done countless number of free dental days where we set up a dental office that wants to provide community service with the ability and the procedures and protocol to be able to do a free day of dentistry for their community. Love it. Every time you do one of these community initiatives, you realize, you know, how inspiring it is and, but yet also how much of a need there is for more affordable dentistry and, and not just affordable dentistry, but easier access to dentistry. Mm -hmm. Dentistry isn't just about making it affordable. Even if you do free dentistry, you'd be amazed at how many people can actually access the free dentistry. Yeah. And I'm not just talking about physical access, but I'm talking about the emotional and mental barriers to be able to access dentistry. Sometimes there's a lot of shame in being able to go and ask for help. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about what it means to be a community dentist. I also volunteer at the uh, one of the Toronto area health units where I do free free day of surgery. Um, I'm trying to do it more regularly, but it's sort of ad hoc once or twice. Um, a few times so far I've been there. Um, I'm also working at the Woodstock Health Unit. Um, all of the all of the sort of this volunteerism and community initiatives isn't just about you know, a lot of it is it makes you feel better, but you also begin to learn what the dental landscape is about. It's not just about associating and learning and becoming a great clinician for your patients, but it's also about understanding where the gaps in the system are. I'm working with a charity organization now called Filling the Gap. Cool little title that, that plays on, yeah. you know, the current, the current situation in dentistry. Um, so it's called Filling the Gap. And um, we want to bring patients that need help. And we want to bring centers that can offer help and bring them together. And so the Rexdale uh, Toronto Health Unit is able to work with the Filling the Gap charity and bring patients and serve them. I love that. That's amazing. I kind of got off on a bit of a... No, no, no. That's that's awesome. Like you've, you've done but, so much. And, you know, so, can... so, so volunteerism, Ricky, is something that I encourage anybody to take on. And let's say all you want to do is learn dentistry, produce, and make lots of money, I still encourage you to understand what volunteerism and community dentistry is all about because it'll make you a more fulfilled dentist, a happier dentist, um, and, and that's always better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always getting out in the community and helping out is always, you know, it's going to do wonders for you and the people around you. So kudos to you, brother. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, 
tell me a little bit more about uh, Ramez himself. So I know you're, you know, you work out quite a bit. What what do you do kind of outside of dentistry as well? You're, I see you always working out with uh, boxing, and you got a good, yeah. uh, good, good couple of jabs and stuff on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you what know, you like boxing. Doing? Yeah. Box. What's that? What do you like doing outside of dentistry? Yeah. Uh, before I sold my practices, I was I was dentistry. Yeah. I literally could not separate the person I am as an individual personally from dentistry. And that's a problem. Uh, we're trained. Dentistry is so hard that you literally have to become dentistry to become really good at it. It's like you become a martyr of dentistry. It's like, I'm going to become so good for my patient. There's no way I'm not going to be able to heal my patient to the highest level. Yeah. Uh, so you become that. And in a lot of ways, that can be unhealthy. And that's a total lack of balance. And I probably easily could be faulted for that. So after I sold my business, I, when I went back to basics, I learned about surgical dentistry, volunteerism. I've been writing a lot more. I just got something published in the Ontario Dental Journal. Um, so, and here I am, there I am, right? I'm going back into dentistry full force. But so on a personal side, um, I do love training and I love spending time with my family and friends. And that's what I um, spend a lot of my time now understanding is, um, you know, what brings me real joy other than dentistry, because dentistry brings me joy, but, um, uh, you have to be, you have to really uh, develop yourself. So I play lots of soccer. I'm doing lots of boxing. Love it. All that stuff helps me channel my energy and keep me, uh, fit. Yeah. And, and of course, spending time with my friends, anytime I can spend time with my friends and family, I take it. So if I can go grab a quick dinner with my parents or have tea, then I do that. You'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. The best tea. They always have the best tea as well. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. They can't make it the same. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but no, I love that. Um, and you're right. It's dentistry is funny in that most dentists get so invested in it that they forget about everything else. It's like it's golden handcuffs. You know, you, you do well, um, you know, you're comfortable living, but then you kind of you can't let it go, but you want to let it go. And and even just you expressing that about, you know, your journey as, as you've gone along, you can tell the progression that you've made. And it kind of feels as if like you've kind of been let out of a, a cage in a way. It's, it's like, it's the way you even talk about it. It's that you, you've just become so much more free after, after ownership. Um, so I guess looking forward now that you've, you know, you've, delved into this oral surgery, mobile dentistry. Um, where do you see yourself going in, in five, 10 years? Where do you see Ramez uh, going from there? Do you think you're ever going to go back to ownership? Do you think you're just going to be continuing, you know, this oral surgery um, program that you have? Where, where do you see it going? Or do you have a plan? Because I know you, you said you just kind of you like to go with the flow. Go, yeah, go with the flow. But, but no, of course I'm, you know, there's no way that a dentist can tell you, oh, yeah, I'm chill. I'm going to go with the flow. Yeah. With, like that, That's a little bit of a lie because we all have to be very strategic, right? When we get into dental school, you're writing the DAT. I was back in the day when I was carving the soap. So we, we have to be quite strategic and macro and thinking. But, but um, where I want to go, I um, so my dream has always been to build like a dental school. Wow. Um, or a dental academy, a training center. Um, there's a lot of training centers out there. And after I sold my business, I realized for 12 years, I had this dream of building a, a dental school. Why? Because when I was an owner, I spent my time training my team. Yeah. And I'm like, there's a need here for more training for dental assistants, dental hygienists, dentists. I had people from the university always coming to shadow me. And so that's something I really, it brought me great joy is sharing what I do because it not only made this person better, it made us better. Yeah. So for me, some sort of training program, but I know there's a lot of training, great training programs out there. So if, if, if I can build a training program that actually fills a need, then, then I'm happy to do it. You know, I don't want to build another program where, you know, where there's, there's, um, if, if that needs already filled, but something in the space of collaborating and sharing 
maybe academia a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, both my parents are teachers in, back in the old country. So teaching is in my blood for sure. Yeah. Um, and building, you know, building, probably building a practice or two is something that I'm really excited to take on in the near future. Um, now that I've sort of exercised all those different things um, and for sure writing more and, and reading more. I love it. And now, and now when you build your practice, it would be you know, it'd be so different because you've been through so much. You've seen it from so many different angles. And now you've worked at so many practices as well, right, with, with this oral, oral, oral surgery program as well. So I think that would be a, definitely a practice to go to as a patient. <laughs> that would be a great practice. That would be, I would love to see the vision there. Um, so hopefully, you know, if that's something that's that you, you'd want to happen, hopefully it happen. But, yeah, so, and, but, I'm I'm happy to be sort of disconnected from that concept though. Like if if the opportunity arises where I can build a practice, that's great. Yeah. But it's not going to define who I am. No, no, no. And but but it but Ricky, that used to be the case. Like to yeah. me, I defined myself through my business, through be, you know, being an owner and so I'm glad that I've disconnected from that and I think that's really healthy for me. Yeah, fresh start. I like that. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Um all right, so let's Kind of end it off with just a little bit of a uh, little bit of fun. I guess actually before we end it off with a little bit of fun, what's some advice for you know whether it's new grads, experienced dentists? Uh, you've given us quite a bit of insights. What's maybe one tidbit that you could give? Even though I, I know we've kind of reached kind of an overarching theme, but what's one tidbit that you give to to anyone out there? The loaded question. Yeah, there's so much, right? Like, I mean, I get, I get asked that, you know, as a, as a teacher, um, all the time. And I'm always giving like, you know, I, you give takeaways at the end of your talks, but, um, and I've lectured at hygiene schools and dental schools and dental assisting schools, but it's always the same message. It's be consistent, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be, be consistent. Like, be consistent, like the power of time and the power of doing something habitually every single day um, is essential. Yes. Um, and, and I would say if something doesn't feel right or something feels right, then listen to that. Yeah. Like that, the, you know, the whisper that you get, your inner soul is telling you something and it's usually in the first second, you know, usually your intuition knows best. Yeah. So listen to that. And doesn't mean that you have to act on it, but always bank it and don't ever, don't ever let, you know, your inner voice, um, go silent, let yourself go in the direction that you're meant to go. And in order to get there and accomplish those goals, you have to remain consistent. You have to have daily habits that speak to that. And you have to be surrounded by the kind of people that are going to cheer for you. And that is one of the hardest things I've come across. And even now in um, at my age and my current, I have 16 years in private practice. It's really hard to find. Um, it's not hard to find. It's hard to, to keep in mind that you have to have people in your life that are cheering you on. Mm -hmm. There's kind of, there's, there's people aren't always, you know, honest with their intentions and yeah. unfortunately, right. But the world is a beautiful place. Yeah. And you can find those people, make sure those people that are in your life are always going to be happy for your success. Yeah. And nice and close to you. Keep them nice and close. Those are special people to have. They're hard to find, but sure. people to have. Um, beautiful, buddy. Uh, I love it. We've had such good, uh, such good talk. I think people are going to get great information from this. Um, let's do a quick, uh, quick little fire, fire questions, I guess. Um, what's your favorite Ooh. procedure? Favorite procedure? I think it's. Did a, I hear you right? Yeah, probably implants or or eights, which I'm assuming it's one of those. Yeah, I, favorite. Okay, so if I I'm gonna be honest, if I want to have a super productive day, yeah, then it's wisdom teeth. But I'm not always about that. For me, my favorite procedure is the beauty of an amazing bone graft. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> like you like you know that you know the membrane and the internal uh, fixation suture. And, and the patient's not bleeding a lot on you, so you can stop and take those photos every single step of the way. 
Yeah. You know, and then you present the case to the patient and the patient's like, you just did that in my mouth. <laughs> and, you know, like, so I'd say like a really beautiful GBR veneer graft. Nice. Okay. What's your least favorite uh, dental procedure? Absolutely. 100% root canal. Root canal. Fair enough. Like on, like I used to love MB2s. I used to love finding MB2s. Yeah. But I'm like, you know what? If I don't have a microscope and I don't have the entire armamentarium that an endodontist would have, I don't really feel like I, I'm not really interested in this microsurgery within this hard tissue that's found in the mouth that, that we call a tooth. It's like, it's a crazy procedure to me. It is. It, is. it definitely is. Um, if you could work on one quadrant for the rest of your life, what would it be? Quad one. Quad one, huh? Interesting. Quad, quad one, man. What, about, what? I'm interested to know what you'd say. I think, I guess it depends on the procedure, but I, I think quad two. I think quad two. I don't know quad why. Quad two. Are you lefty or, or righty? Or righty. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's pretty similar. They're both on the upper, so. Um, I like quad one because if I'm in quad two, I'm removing a granuloma from an infected two six, which I literally just did this well multiple times this week. Um, I have to turn the patient's head all the way to me, and I have to get around the two five. <laughs> and let's say they have a really narrow buccal corridor, I got to retract that really muscular cheek, yeah. and I'm trying to look up into the apex of the two two six. It's really hard. Whereas the one six, I can just turn the patient to the left a bit and I can kind of just uh, tear my back apart and just have a quick look at the Yeah. I don't know. And then definitely not three or four because there's all kinds of critical structures and big fat tongues and saliva in the, in the floor of the mouth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't like quad three and four. Not my, not, not okay. the gym. Yeah. If it was all <laughs> for quadrants, it'd be nice. Um, beautiful buddy. Thank you so much. Uh, it was awesome having you on the podcast. Uh, I'm sure people are going to be super excited by this. And I think you said this might have been your first. You've done so much teaching and stuff that you said this might be your first podcast. So we're. I'm pretty sure this is my first podcast. Like I, yeah, I don't. I didn't want to admit it to, <laughs> yeah, to you. But yeah, I think this is my. So when you ask me, I'm like, I'm probably not the best guy to ask. But no, no, I. It's my first one, and I really appreciate that it's with you. And, you know, I love that we collaborated at the Dentistry Academy and Surgery. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Hopefully we continue to do so as well. I know. Yeah, we, for sure. Yeah, I know we will. So I appreciate it. Thank you. If people want to reach you, um, I know you have a great Instagram. You always post. I like that your Instagram is very patient-centered as well. Always posting stuff with your patients and their stories. Uh, where can people reach you at? What's your Instagram handle? Yeah, so it's dr.remez.salty. Um, so you and you can also email me at remezsalty at gmail.com. But Instagram is the best way to get a hold of me. Um, and Instagram is a funny thing. I don't put a lot of x rays and clinical photos. Yeah. I know the best Instagrams out there have really great, like, clinical, bloody photos. Um, I don't know. For me, like I told you before, it's about the patient's story. Yeah. Um, and you show like, that. I, I just want to tell you about Norton, you know, Norton is a patient of mine that I had in the past year, uh, did upper lower clearance, jaw reconstruction, six upper implants, five lower implants, immediate conversion, same day, all under IV sedation. It was a 10 hour procedure, double arch. Um, and I did a, I did a media release with him so I can talk about this freely. But when I did an, he always came in with his lovely wife, uh, Camilla, Yes. And we did a, uh, an interview, uh, right before the surgery. And he said the most compelling thing to me, uh, it really got a hold of me. He said, he's been ashamed of his smile. He hasn't wanted to smile to his parents. He's in his fifties, young guy, young guy, right? Ricky young guy, very uh... young guy. And, um, so, but he said this to me, he said, he felt like he had a dental disability. And when he said the words dental disability to me, I just uh, stopped. And I'm like, I've never heard anybody call it a dental disability. I've had patients with like amputee patients. Yeah. Uh, um, like Steven, um, who I did an interview with as well. Um, but when, when Norton called it a dental disability, it really, it really got a hold of me. And I realized um, it's about the story. And you don't have to have 
all your teeth having to, you know, you don't have to have full reconstruction for it to be a compelling story. Mm -hmm. You can have just one missing tooth or you could have like, you know, like just a little bit of work that you need yeah. and you're just really shy or you have a phobia, but everybody has their story. And so that's what I love sharing on Instagram. I know. And I love seeing that as well. I love that part of your Instagram. Uh, thanks again, Ramez. Appreciate you having on this podcast and uh, looking forward to releasing this. Thanks again, brother. <laughs> Thanks so much, brother. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Dental Journeys podcast sponsored by White Coat Financial. Join us next time for another episode where we explore the journeys, strategies, and successes of dental professionals.